uh, right now, um, probably right now they're hard-working folk up on Russell Hill, they're beavering away on the third white paper in six years. One in 2009, one in 2013, one due out next year in 2015. Now given that in the last 40 years or so white papers have come out I think on average every eight or nine years or something like that, the fact that we're heading up for our third in six years suggests that something is wrong given that the purpose of a white paper is to provide a long-term set of decisions to provide the framework in which the decisions are made and then to publicise a long-term set of decisions about the kinds of capabilities we should be building, the kinds of money we should be spending and the purposes for which we're doing it. And because of the time frames in which defence policy works, the fact that you need to stop and start three times in six years suggests that something's gone wrong with the process. And indeed, I think it has. And I want to try and explain to you what I think that is and how I think we can fix it. To do that, I'm going to deep, dig a little bit deeper than one might perhaps at first think, because at first glance, the most obvious problem with defence policy today is the disconnect between the present plans for developing our defence forces, the things the government now plans to buy and maintain on the one hand and the sums of money they plan to spend on the other. Um, and that's, of course, that's only one part of defence policy. Making sure you've got enough money to buy the capabilities you've, you've, you've said you're going to buy is a, is a very important part of it, but it's only one part of it. And one could argue, in fact, that the Abbott government's commitment to spend... Uh, to raise defence spending to 2% of GDP uh, over the next uh, eight years or so has at least started to look like an answer to that problem. If they do get to 2% of GDP um, by 2024, uh, as they've promised, and I'm not completely sure they will, but if they do get to, to, to that, then I think they've got a fair chance of solving that particular problem, or at least the most obvious parts of it. But I don't think that's the really important problem we face. I think under, underlying, underneath the disconnect between capability and dollars that we're seeing at the moment, which has arisen really since, especially since the 20, uh, 2009 white paper, there's a much bigger, much deeper, much more fundamental problem which, which rolls through into a lot of different parts of the, of the portfolio and a lot of the different issues that we deal with. And that is the, the more basic questions about what kind of armed forces we need, what sort of money we should be spending on them, and of course what's related to both of those, what we want it to do. And I don't think we've got good answers to those questions at the moment, and I don't think we'll get defence policy right until we do. And I want to explore that set of questions over the next 40 minutes, 35 minutes now. First, just to put one thing to one side, in, in a... In a concise and perhaps some will feel peremptory kind of way, I want to just put on the table a proposition that when we talk about the purposes of, for, for which we build armed force and the kinds of armed forces we're building, I'm going to say that our principal uh, intention there is and should remain to manage the kinds of strategic risks that arise to Australia from the use of armed force by other nation states. It's a pretty narrow definition. It's not to say that a country like Australia doesn't face a lot of other kind of risks. It is to say that the only thing for which armed force is reliably cost effective is the kind of risks I just defined, that is, risks that arise from the use of armed force by other nation states. You can use the armed forces you've built for that purpose uncost effectively, but maybe still justifiably, for other kinds of roles, disaster relief and so on. But the only purposes for which it makes sense to design and build armed forces is the ones for which they're most cost effective and, those, and the only purpose of that are response to armed force by other states. In other words, we should build our armed forces to fight wars and if we don't think we're going to fight any wars, we shouldn't build armed forces. It's just about as simple as that. Now, I'm happy to address that further in discussion if people want it, but let me just put that on the table to start with. If that's true, then a simple way to frame the question at the heart of Australian defence policy today is simply this, that the, um, the answers to those questions that I talked about before, what kind of forces do we need, how much should we spend, what do we want them to be able to do, is going to depend on, the, on our international setting, that is the way in which the, the framework of nation states in which Australia exists um, functions. And the simple question I would say right at the heart of Australian defence policy today 
is will the defence policy that developed in the very specific international circumstances that we enjoyed in Asia over roughly speaking the last 40 years, I would say since 1972, will that defence policy work in what we shall call, what I'm, I'll call for the sake of conciseness, the Asian century? And by Asian century, I mean a century in which the distribution of wealth and power is very radically different from the way it was uh, when that order, when the previous order, the, the post-Vietnam 1972 order was established. And because of that shift in the distribution of wealth and power, the strategic objectives of a number of key players are, I think, radically different. Now, the very strong assumption that underpins the last two white papers in 2009 and 2013 was that the basic policy that we established in the post-Vietnam era will continue to function, will still work for us for the next 30 or 40 years as it has for the last 40 years. And that to me is a profoundly counterintuitive conclusion because I would argue, this is a separate debate, um, but I would argue that uh, the shifts that we encapsulate by that phrase Asian century do constitute the biggest shift in the foundations of Australia's international situation since European settlement in 1788. Well, that's a big claim. I, I, I'm, I'll have a debate about maybe it's just the biggest shift since the beginning of the decline of the British Empire in the late 18th, 19th century. It's certainly the biggest shift since then because for the first time we have in Asia an Asian state which is in the not too distant future going to be richer than our great and powerful friends and therefore in this is a complex argument for another time but it fundamentally more powerful and certainly a very able better able than any Asian state has been before to compete with our Anglo-Saxon great and powerful friends uh, for a primary role in the Asian order. So this is my, my starting point is that it's counterintuitive to assume that in Asia, which is going to work profoundly differently, the defence policy which served us for the last 40 years will keep serving us as well for the, last, for the next 40 years. And that assumption is the assumption that underlies our existing defence policy. Now that counterintuitive counter judgment um, that I want to try and dismantle for you seems to me to be based on five subordinate judgments. Um, and I'll just spell them out for you. The first is that um, notwithstanding what I think most people now accept, and that is that the, that the shift in wealth and power is for real, and even if it slows down, it's already gone far enough to make a fundamental difference. But even, even people who accept that hope that uh, nonetheless, the escalating strategic rivalry that one might fear would arise from that will be constrained. That the Asian order won't change that much because notwithstanding the massive change in the distribution of wealth and power, states, and particularly the most powerful states, and particularly China, will continue to accept the old order pretty much as they used to in the decades after 1972. In other words, that China will accept US primacy as the foundation for the Asian order, even as its economy approaches and overtakes America's. Well, maybe. Um, I'll come back to that. The second assumption, or judgment at least, is that even if there is escalating strategic rivalry, even if uh, we do see um, that kind of fundamental shift in the nature of the Asian order. That won't necessarily undermine Australia's security that much because the United States will stay engaged in Asia, arguably, uh, and, and it will continue to play the same kind of role, and it will continue to protect Australia and shield Australia from any very significant shifts in, in our basic uh, strategic setting. And if that was true, of course, that would be a good reason to think that the old defence policy would keep working for us. The third judgment is that following from the first two is that we won't need our, AD, our, our armed forces to do anything fundamentally different in coming decades from what, than what it's done for us in previous decades. In other words, we won't, in particular, we won't need it to do more to support our allies, and particularly the United States, than, we're, than it's been required to do over the last few decades, and which it has done quite well, of course. We have quite a good record. It has worked well. And nor is it going to be required to do things independently of the United States beyond the kinds of things that we've anyway been prepared to do independently uh, in what we might call the post-Vietnam defence era. That is the kind of 
stabilisation operations in the immediate neighbourhood or the low-level contingencies from the, and the mythical Camaria, uh, which have loomed so large at different times in Australia's defence planning. Um, and if that was true, then the fourth judgement is that the forces we're now planning, which look a lot like the forces we've used in the past, will deliver those, the, the, the kinds of operations we'll need in future because the operations we'll need in future will look a lot like the operations we've done in the past. And the fifth judgment is anyway, even if that wasn't true, there's not much we can do about it because no government in Australia will ever spend more than 2% of GDP on defence, so we're stuck with it. Now what I want to do is to just work through those judgments one by one, see if they're right and see what it means if they're not right and see what we can offer in their stead. Um, the first one, point about um, that notwithstanding the shift in power that escalating strategic rivalry will be constrained. This is a big subject and I've spent a lot of the last couple of years uh, arguing about it um, and so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it right here and now, but I just want to say that um, uh, it's, it's very important to say that, like many other people, I don't regard escalating strategic rivalry as inevitable. Uh, but unlike some of the people who use that phrase, including a number of our Prime Ministers over the last decade or so, I don't think saying it's not inevitable is very reassuring. It's not inevitable, but it's very probable. Uh, and, you know, like bushfires aren't inevitable, but near enough for it not to matter. I think there's a very high likelihood that strategic rivalry in Asia is going to escalate. Um, and it's worth bearing in mind that if it doesn't, it would only be because one side or the other has given way. Um, uh, and uh, that would itself produce a new set of strategic risks. So I think it is a very serious risk. And I think it's in particular the one that a defence policy has to focus on most. Defence policy shouldn't focus on worst cases solely, but nor should it focus on best cases. And to base our thinking about our defence policy on the assumption that the biggest shift in the distribution of wealth, wealth and power produces no fundamental shift in the way the order works seems to me like a very best case kind of approach. Um, uh, so I think uh, instead of assuming that escalating strategic rivalry won't happen, I think we should recognise as a very high probability uh, that a more contested Asia and in particular an Asia in which strategic relations between the region's major powers are more contested, will have higher strategic risks for the region as a whole and higher strategic risks for Australia specifically, different points. Our strategic risks aren't identical to everybody else's, but as the strategic risks in the region of the whole increase, Australia's strategic risks increase. And by strategic risk, I mean very roughly the, the probability and the seriousness of conflicts, of us getting involved in substantial conflicts. Um, it is less unlikely that Australia will find itself going to war in a major war in our region over the next few decades and has been over the last few decades because the uncontested US primacy, which has been such a robust foundation for stable Asian order, is passing away. And we should absolutely not assume that in our defence policy, we should not assume that away. Completely separate point. A very high priority for our diplomatic policy, for our foreign policy, should be to do whatever we can to prevent that happening. And I think uh, uh, it's terribly important that, uh, that we not confuse that diplomatic imperative on the one hand with the defence policy imperative to do what we can to, to manage our situation should the diplomats not succeed. And I just make the point in passing, I don't think the diplomats are succeeding. So that's the first judgment. The second judgment is that, uh, okay, not to worry, the US will stay engaged even if strategic rivalry escalates. And there's a kind of a, a, a view here, there's a, there's a kind of a self-regulating mechanism that the more assertive the region's major powers, and particularly China, becomes, the more actively the United States remains engaged to counter it, and the more we can rely on the United States to protect us. So even if our strategic risks go up, our strategic insurance policy improves at the same time, and so it all ends up balancing up, and there's nothing much more we need to do. Um, uh, this, is, this does not seem at all clear to me. The situation that America will face in Asia, the costs and risks to the United States of preserving its leadership position in the region over coming decades, if strategic rivalry escalates, 
will be very different and much higher than the costs and risks the United States has faced in the post-Vietnam era. One of the many distinctive things about the era that we have, I believe, moving out of, the era in which US primacy has been uncontested, is that that has made US leadership in Asia very cheap for America. And that's been, of course, to our immense, everyone's immense good benefit. But uh, the, the, I think it's very unwise for us to assume that if and as strategic rivalry escalates and as I think inevitably happens, that raises the cost and risk to the United States of attempting to preserve leadership in Asia and to maintain the kind of alliance responsibilities it has, it becomes less and less clear that the United States will decide that those growing costs and risks are justified by the scale of US interests. Because it's not clear that US interests in Asia have actually increased unless you regard the maintenance of leadership itself as an interest. So I think there's a very unclear, it's very doubtful that, that, that US leadership um, uh, is as robust in Asia, in a more contested Asia, it has been uh, hitherto. Now, of course, that's a hard argument to make because people have um, predicted uh, a decline in US leadership in Asia so reliably in the past, and one does feel a little bit like crying wolf. But it's always worth remembering a point about the crying wolf story is that the wolf came eventually. You know, just because people have predicted it wrongly in the past doesn't mean it, it won't happen in future. And I think this one's different, because I think China is a different kind of rival for America, stronger, scarier. And America's interests are lower. America's interests in Asia are not, I think, as strong as they were, for example, in Europe, or for that matter, in Asia during the Cold War. Now, if that's true, then in order for Australia to remain as confident as we have been in the past of US support in the face of escalating strategic rivalry, we would have to be willing to do more to support the United States in the region, and so I might add with other countries. We'd have to be able to do more to support it, to keep it here, to encourage it to stay. And we'd also have to do more, I think, slightly different point, to shape its policies to make sure that what it was doing in Asia was congenial to us, worked for us. The more contested the region, the more the US finds itself engaged in really serious strategic competition, the more risk there is that what the United States does is not going to work for us. And the more risk there is, it'll stop doing it and work away. So I think what that means is that um, we cannot be as confident that the US will stay engaged and we cannot, um, and, and if in, in response to that lower confidence, there's a likelihood that we'll need to do more to shape the way the United States operates and to contribute to what the US does. And of course, more for ourselves against the possibility that it does in fact leave. So that brings us to the third judgment. That is that um, the, our defense policy can no longer assume that the sorts of things that we needed our armed forces to be able to do over the last 40 years and that we're still designing our defense forces to do in future that might not be enough. If those two judgments I've just explored turn out not to be right, then we have to at least consider, and I'll come back later to talk a bit more about the nature of that consideration, we need to at least consider what, what, how we might be able to do more, perhaps much more, to support the United States in Asia. And by that I don't mean anything soft and cuddly. I mean, to support the United States in a major war with a major power in Asia. And we might have to think more equally about how we do more to defend ourselves independently without US support if the US turns out to go. Um, so I think it'd be very unwise for us to assume, as I think the present policy does, that we won't have to do substantially more in future with our armed forces than we have in our past. Um, now, once um, we see that we might need the ADF to do more, the big questions, the really deep questions become, well, what more and how much more? These are very big subjects and I won't dig into them as deeply as I might, but let me just give you the sketch. What more could we do? Now, it's tempting in the Australian defence debate, and it often happens in the Australian defence debate, that this that that question is foreclosed at the outset by an assumption that there's sort of nothing more we could do. 
you know, there's a sort of view that Australia's strategic posture is fixed, that has been that way forever. Actually, it hasn't been that way forever. It's been that way since the early 1970s. But that's before anybody else, if, if, all of our memories, roughly speaking, most of us probably, um, and before mine anyway, uh, still. Um, uh, and that it's almost unimaginable that we could have a significantly different kind of defence posture, a significantly different kind of defence force than the one we've got at the moment. Uh, that is, of course, terribly serious and dangerous assumption. And it's wrong, of course. Australia has, in fact, changed its defence posture in quite significant ways, several times in its history. It's not something you do every week. It's not something you do without a great deal of thought. You only do it when your strategic circumstances fundamentally change. But we did it in the late 19th century and early 20th century. We did it after the First World War and again briefly and ineffectively in the lead up to the Second World War. We did it very fundamentally in the decade after the Second World War as we came to terms with the Cold War in Asia and independence in our region and all of that. And we did it again at the end of the Vietnam era in the early 1970s. We, we, we can do this, um, but only if we recognise the need. And what's striking is that in each of those decision points the need was recognised and... Um, and responded to um, a bit late in the case of the 1930s. Um, now, that requires us to, 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 to do that, though, to think what different things might we do, it requires us to explore in some detail how Australia could most cost-effectively use armed force to support our allies and to defend ourselves in more demanding circumstances. And that requires us to recognise explore the, the strengths, the inherent strengths and weaknesses in our strategic situation. Um, we are, the weaknesses are pretty clear. We are small and in relative terms, and I mean primarily economically, we're small and shrinking. And that's a very significant factor relative to the region. But we do have the immense advantage of living in a maritime environment. It's not just that we're an island, it's that all our neighbours are islands and that a lot of the power in Asia is insular. And usually, compared to any of the other great continents, much more maritime uh, focus in, in Asia than there is in, um, in, in other continents. Um, the third advantage is that although our demographics are small, our technology is relatively deep, and we have, for our size, a reasonable sized economy, though dwindling, as I said, in relation to the rest of the region. And those sets of opportunities, strengths and weaknesses, do give us something to work on. To abbreviate quite a complicated argument, the first thing it tells us is that whatever we do, we'll do at sea. And the key question is, at sea and in the air over the sea, of course, and the key question is, what should that be? And again, to abbreviate a very long argument, the minimum we can do to achieve strategic effects at sea is to deny the use of the sea to others in a range of circumstances both in relation to the security of our own air and maritime approaches and in relation to the security of the air and maritime approaches of all those other islands in the Western Pacific. And the really critical point is that would probably achieve a high proportion of our strategic objectives. We d and the other side of that coin is we don't need to be able to control the sea and use it ourselves in order to achieve most of our strategic objectives, we can achieve most of our strategic objectives by denying the use of the sea to others. Now, let me just try and discipline myself to about three minutes explanation as to why I say that, because it's a very critical issue. The difference between sea denial and sea control is pretty straightforward. Sea denial is the capacity to stop somebody else using the sea, to project power, or for that matter, to send cargo or whatever. And sea control is the capacity to do the opposite, that is to stop somebody else from stopping them using the sea. It's not just the capacity to use the sea, it's the capacity to use the sea in the face of others' efforts to stop you. And for a long time, I mean for centuries, sea denial and sea control were really two sides of the same coin because everything you did at sea beyond the range of land-based artillery was done from a ship uh, to carry stuff carry forces or cargoes or whatever, you had to put it in a ship, and the more you wanted to carry, the bigger ship you had to be. And to stop a ship, you needed to stop it, you needed to hit it with a gun. And guns are big, and the bigger the gun, the bigger the ship. 
And so you ended up with big ships with big guns running up against other big ships with other big guns and you got a scene very much like, you know, think of a painting of the Battle of Trafalgar, a totally symmetrical operation. You can't tell by looking who was doing sea control and who was doing sea denial in that picture. Actually, it was Nelson was doing the sea denial. He was trying to prevent the Spanish and the French using the sea uh, to deploy forces against Britain. Classic sea denial operation, but you can't tell by looking. Then in the late 19th century, some clever person thought of ways of sinking ships that didn't involve using big guns. Just a different way of delivering the high explosive against the hull. Torpedoes, mines, a few decades later, bombs. And you no longer needed to put a big ship to sea to sink a ship. And from that point, the asymmetry between sea control and sea denial, what you need to do to have a ship at sea and what you need to do to stop somebody else having a ship at sea, started growing and it's kept growing ever since. And it's one of the ways in which recent technologies, one of the few ways I would say, in which recent technologies have actually significantly changed uh, uh, op the operational balance further. That is, it, ships become easier to find and easier to sink. Uh, and it becomes harder to stop somebody else finding you and sinking you. This is an absurdly crude and impressionistic um, quantification, but in broad terms, I reckon it takes 10 times as much effort to achieve sea control as it does to achieve sea denial. And to put it very bluntly, I don't believe that Australia or for that matter the United States, or for that matter anybody else, can reliably achieve strategically significant uh, amounts of sea, of sea control in the face of the sea denial um, efforts of major Asian powers like China, and vice versa. I think we're heading into an era in which many countries are going to have the capacity to deny the sea, and very few are going to have the capacity to control it and therefore use it themselves. This is good news overall. Bad news for the US Navy because US Navy is a very much a sea control Navy. US strategic posture in Asia is fundamentally based on its capacity to project power by sea back. Good news for the rest of us. Um, uh, you know, the bad news is the United States can no longer project power by sea against China. The good news is China can't project power by sea against anybody. Not just not against the United States, not against Japan either. That's what all those submarines are for. They don't sell them all to us. Um, and you can t the implications of that are very clear in the way in which US strategy in Asia has evolved. That's why they're looking, that's why they're so fussed about what they call anti-access and area denial capabilities. That's just their word for sea denial. And, um, uh, and that's why they're pushed to operational options like the air sea battle, which is, to cut a long story short, not gonna work for them because it's too escalatory. As a broad proposition then, I think that focus on the idea of sea denial as an operational option which would deliver Australia opportunities to, to do more to support the United States and do more to work by ourselves is a terribly important thing for us to focus on. Second question is how much? Another very big question, and we have to split it up here. How much, do, how much more do we need to do to support the United States in an environment in which the United States does actually stick around? Well, just to put it very impressionistically, much more than anything we've done in the last 30 years, much more than anything we've done since in the, going off to the Gulf, for example, um, uh, much more than we're doing, we're offering to do right now in a, in a, again in Iraq and Syria, more like, more comparable to the scale of, of, of effort that we had in Korea and Vietnam, more like the scale of effort that Britain had in supporting the United States in NATO or in the Gulf. In the end, it depends on how much influence we want to have in keeping the US engaged and in shaping what it does in Asia. And it's, you can't do precise quantifications on this, but it's not a token, which is what we've really been into. It's a substantial, operationally significant contribution to the key operational priorities. And as for the defence of Australia, how much do we need to do? The big question as to whether it even makes sense for Australia to contemplate trying to defend the continent independently in conflicts that might involve, involve major Asian powers. Most of us, most of the time, just presume that's impossible. I don't think that's necessarily true. I'm not, sh I'm not sure that it's, that it's true, but I, I, think, I, I think there's a chance that it isn't. Um, it depends a lot on how you define success. If you define success by 
not just preventing the other guy attacking you, but you attacking him, rolling into his capital and marching down his main street uh, with flags flying, and we're not going to do it. But if you define success as raising the costs and risks to an adversary to the point where it's not worth their effort, in view of the forces that they can deploy and sustain in your part of the world, and when you're someone like Australia, which is a long way from the major powers, that's not a very big proportion of their, of their forces, then I think there's a chance that that might not be as impossible as people imagine. It's certainly worth exploring. So there are some options, with some answers to the, to the what and how much question as to what more we'd need to be able to do if the forces we're planning at the moment the assumption that the force we're planning at the moment are going to do enough for us. And just to be clear, I think it's very plain, this is the fourth assumption, that the forces we are now planning won't do enough for us. I'm not going to dig into this in much detail, partly because I think it's important to look at the other issues rather than get into an enjoyable discussion about whether the JSF is a better aircraft than the F-22 and all of that. But to put it very briefly, the forces that would be required to, to, to achieve something like the strategic objective, the operational objectives I've talked about, and something like the quantity I've suggested, would have a lot more submarines and a lot more air. Air power, Joint Strike Fighter, air-to-air -air refueling, AW and C, all of that, than we are now planning. Twice as much, maybe. And it would have much less a high uh, emphasis on amphibious forces for high, for high level operations. Uh, the sorts of things that are the focus of so much of our force development at the moment. I don't believe uh, amphibious land forces are going to be a cost-effective operational option for Australia uh, in the environment I'm trying to describe to you. And the fifth point, of course, is that that would cost a lot more. That kind of force would cost a lot more. So if the assumption is that just no way, forget it, no Australian government is ever going to spend more than 2% of GDP on defence, if that assumption is right, then forget it. Well... I'm not sure it is right. I certainly think it's an assumption we have to explore very carefully. Um, in the 1950s and 1960s, which is the last time Australia built a defence posture to respond to an Asia that was contested between major powers, Australia spent between 3 and 4%, average of, I think, about 3.6% over the two decades. Um, countries like Britain and the United States have been spending that kind of level since the end of the Cold War. Um, so although it's higher than we've been spending for the last uh, 30 years, odd, it's not unthinkably high. We, we, it's a choice we could make as a country. Um, I don't think we can call it unthinkable. And we shouldn't be surprised that in a very different set of strategic circumstances in which we face new risks and new demands, we end up with a different and larger defence budget. It would be a perfectly natural thing to conclude. Um, so I don't think it's unthinkable. Um, but I don't think it's easy either. It's not a decision. A decision to make a sustained increase in defence spending is not something you'd take at all lightly. You might have a very strong argument as to why precisely it was necessary. Uh, and you'd need some real leadership to deliver it. And that brings me to the, what you might call a core public policy point, of what is, after all, a public policy lecture. Um, Australia has a choice to make, a classic public policy choice to make. As, strategic, as our strategic circumstances shift in the Asian century. And it's not that unlike the kinds of choices that we make f face in other areas of public policy. And in, in some ways, for example, that's a probably contentious one to mention, in some ways a little bit like the choices in relation to climate change. That is, you have a big and complex long-term set of shifts, a bit of uncertainty about how real they are and what can be done to ameliorate them, some potentially very big costs to do anything about them, very high level consequence if it doesn't pay off. Um, and it takes, it's a very demanding public policy challenge to try and present the issues and options and ideas in the public policy space, in the political space, in the space of public debate, in a way that really gets the questions on the table. And it's a challenge in particular for a political system to do that effectively. In the end, the choices that we face, like many public policy choices, not just climate change, but we must say in some ways, well, a very large number of public policy choices anyway, is a balance between cost and risk. It's a balance between our tolerance of higher strategic risk in an inherently more risky strategic environment on the one hand, and our willingness to spend money 
to take the steps necessary to ameliorate those risks. That is precisely the kind of choice we face in this circumstance. We have a more risky strategic environment and we have a choice as to how much more, if any, we spend to manage that risk. And that just depends how we feel about the risk and how much we feel about the costs and opportunity costs of spending that money on it. Of spending an extra one or two percent of GDP on defence rather than spending it on something else or giving it back as tax cuts. Now, it's easy to say, in other words, that the risks are higher. I'm pretty sure they are. I don't think that's a very difficult argument to make. But that doesn't necessarily mean that they're high enough, that they're sufficient, that the, that the increase is big enough to warrant spending enough money, the, the, the sums of money that would be needed, to effectively reduce them. And it's just worth making the point, there's no sense here in spending more money, or even spending as much money as we're spending at the moment, unless we spend enough and spend it wisely enough to actually reduce the risks. It's perfectly possible to spend more money and not actually make a material difference because you don't buy yourself enough to, do, to, to, to build more options. And I think that's in fact one of our risks. Um, and you could perfectly validly make the judgment, I'm not sure myself I don't make the judgment, that although our risks are higher in the Asian century, they're not so much higher than they were than to, to warrant that additional spending. It's interesting to, to recognise just how much benefit we get from our strategic geography, including our remoteness. If we were Japan or the Philippines right now, thinking about what they've gone through in the last couple of years, thinking about the predicament they're in, um, thinking about how they see China in particular, um, and you ask, how would Australia's policy debate be responding to their situation? I think it'd be responding very differently to the way they are and very differently to the way we're responding to our situation. And it's interesting, shows all sorts of interesting things you could draw from that. But it does just remind us what a big difference geography does make. So we could take a bet. We could take a bet either that strategic rivalry won't escalate or that if it does escalate, the US will stick around and won't require much more support from us to stick around and look after us. Or that if that doesn't happen, we have escalating strategic rivalry and less support from the United States. Nonetheless, Australia could just rely on its remote remoteness to keep out of trouble, uh, to keep our head down. And we could, we can influence how easy that is. If we're prepared to keep our head down, if we're prepared to be a kind of a, well, let's call it a small power, one that doesn't go around throwing its weight around, telling what the Russians should do in the, in the Ukraine, Etc. I could give quite a long list, but you know what I mean. We want to be a meek and mild power that doesn't get into trouble by keeping its head down. We, that's an option for it. It really is an option for us, and we don't want to dismiss it because the alternative could be pretty expensive. It's, it's that, it's, that's what you have to balance against the cost. If the cost of, of forces to manage the risks more assertively, in other words, to not make those assumptions, to not take that bet, but to say, no, let's recognise that there's a serious risk there. there. What would we need to do to take the kinds of steps I've talked about to manage it? If that was going to cost 10% of GDP, I think it'd be pretty easy to get a consensus that it wasn't worth it. You'd rather live with a risk. If it was going to cost two and a bit percent of GDP, just a bit more than we're spending at the moment, it'd be pretty easy to, take, to make the judgement, well, well, that's not much, and the risks are reasonably serious, let's pay that. Three or four percent, which is where I think it ends up being, is kind of in the middle. It's a, it's a lot more, so it's worth taking seriously. It's not so much more that you would regard it as out of the question. I think that is, in fact, the kind of choice that we have to make. And we have to recognise that when we make that kind of choice, we're not just deciding about our defence posture. We're deciding, to a significant degree, what kind of country we are. Um, I don't want to go all Anzac Day on you here. Um, I don't think Australia is defined by its military past or its military present, but it is true that the kind of, to an extent that more than perhaps most, many of us realise, the kind of um, military power you are does influence the kind of player you are internationally. And that would, that would say something about the kind of country we were. It would make us a small power. That's not necessarily a bad thing to do. Lots of small powers in the world, some of them are very nice countries. But that's the choice we'd make. Now, that is a decision we do have to make, and it's a decision we should make very carefully. It's one thing that, that is to decide that the risks are acceptable and to keep going with what we're doing rather than to make some significant changes. It's another to pretend that the risks aren't there. 
and to pretend that we're not actually making a choice. And I think that's what we're doing at present. So just to be clear, I'm not offering you here an argument for bigger defence forces and a bigger defence budget. I'm offering an argument that says that we need to have, that we face very significant decisions about that question in the face of our changing strategic environment and that those decisions need to be made very carefully and very rigorously. The assumptions that underline them has to be, have to be tested, the judgments have to be open to scrutiny and the costs and risks on both sides of the argument have to be weighed very carefully. Um, and that, of course, having done that, that would provide the basis on which governments could go to the public and argue for a higher defence budget or go to the public <coughs> and say, we've looked at this and we think on balance we're better off staying where we are and accepting those higher risks. And any government who thinks that they couldn't make that argument and also thinks they couldn't make an argument for higher defence spending really has got a problem because I think the choice is just about that stark. Now that, of course, would require a completely different kind of defence debate. At the, at the, at an approach to defence policy, not just by um, my friends and colleagues and competitors in the media or, um, or by academics uh, or by public servants, but also, of course, by politicians on both sides of politics. Uh, I don't think there's any guarantee that we'll get that. But I think it is certain that if we don't get it, if we don't get a different kind of defence debate and a different kind of analysis of the issues I've been talking about, we will find ourselves drifting into the Asian century with our defence policy out of control. And doing the other thing, getting a handle on these issues, is I think the only way to really fix defence policy. Thank you very much.